O Christ, the true light, who enlightens and sanctifies every man that cometh into the world, let the light of thy countenance be signed upon, it, that, upon us, that in it we may see the unapproachable light, and guide our steps in the doing of thy commandments through the intercessions of the most pure mother and of all the saints. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Your Eminence. And thank everyone that uh, has joined us for tonight's Zoom presentation, The Orthodox Christian at the Doctors. Uh, St. Fortius Orthodox Theological Seminary here in Etna, California is so grateful uh, to present this lecture by Dr. Father Deacon Peter Bushino, uh, covering many of the issues and questions regarding health, illness, and the medical health care system in light of the spiritual and practical concerns of an Orthodox Christian. It will also address some of the pastoral principles on how to prepare for and respond when confronted by a serious health concern, uh, whether our own or a loved one's. A brief introduction of Father Peter. He was born and raised in upstate New York. Uh, his, his parents, thankfully, my grandparents, were able to flee the Soviet Union during the upheaval of World War II. He graduated with a, a bachelor's in philosophy from Wash U in St. Louis in 1982, and then continued on to medical school also at Washington University, graduating in 1986. Uh, during medical school, at the time a, a lay person, uh, Father Peter was one of the founding members of the St. John Chrysostomus Parish, uh, where Diaconisa Melissa was baptized and reader Dr. John and Mary Johnstone were her sponsors. Uh, Dr. John was an internist at the St. Louis University, and he was also very close to uh, Monk Ionikios at the time of the Holy Mountain, uh, now a uh, hieroschema monk John at the St. Cyprian and Justina Monastery in Philly, Greece. Uh, together with Father Ionikios and, and Dr. John, Father Peter worked on multiple articles and materials on topics related to the practical aspects of the intersection of religion and medicine. Um, Dr. Peter was an active member of St. Mary's uh, Parish in Syracuse, New York, where he trained in the internal medicine and oncology at SUNY Upstate Medical Center. And his first appointment was a, as a clinical assistant professor at the University of Rochester. He practices medical oncology at Rochester General Hospital as is currently an adjunct clinical professor of oncology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, as well as a senior attending physician and director of oncology research and clinical trials for Rochester Regional Health. He served as a reader in the Protection of the Mother of God, uh, Rokor Parish, but at the time of the union between the Rokor and the Moscow Patriarchate, he received the canonical release uh, from Metropolitan Loris to go under the Omophorian of Metropolitan Chrysostomos. Uh, he was ordained to the diaconate by his eminence, Metropolitan Chrysostomos in 2011. And Father Deacon and Diaconisa have five sons uh, whom they all homeschooled. And Father was especially uh, involved in leading instruction in the sciences, uh, construction skills and logic and rhetoric. So, Father Peter has many publications of clinical trials of treatment of the central nervous malignancies as well as supportive care in cancer. And we are very grateful for his, um, his efforts and, and contributions uh, as a founding member of the board of directors of St. Fortius Orthodox Theological Seminary. This talk tonight was originally given sort of as an impromptu uh, presentation when Father Peter was here at the seminary earlier last year in the fall uh, for a, a board meeting, as well as to meet and represent the seminary uh, for the Accreditations Commission's team visit when, when they sent a team out to Aetna uh, to conduct a, a team visit of the facility and they also wanted to meet, in addition to administration and students, they also met uh, with the board members. And at that time, I had asked Father Peter to uh, give a, a short presentation to the seminarians and the students. It was very well received, and we're so grateful that he's agreed to um, 
sort of repeat his presentation to all of us. So without further ado, um, please, Father Peter, thank you. Well, thank you, Alexei, for the kind introduction. I, uh, it saves me a lot of work of writing my autobiography uh, when, uh, when that becomes necessary. But uh, um, so uh, your eminence, uh, uh, father, holy fathers and mothers and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, um, I'm speaking about something that almost all of us will have to do is go to the doctor um, my follow-up talk will be about going to the dentist, which is much less pleasant, but uh, we'll save that for another day. Um, I want to emphasize that this talk will be very practical. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, a lot of theological principles or bioethical theories or anything like that, because I think this is something that on a very personal and pastoral level in a, uh, is very important to review um, some of these issues. Um, let me start by just reviewing our objectives. Again, uh, we'll discuss some of the challenges facing us as Christians in a society that's becoming, you know, honestly more and more secular and, um, and oriented away from Christianity. Um, I definitely want to review some very pious practices or steps that we should take if we become ill or someone in our family or, or our parish is ill. And these lead to very important pastoral opportunities. Um, I want to emphasize that that is not just for clergy, but for lay people as well. Uh, visiting the sick and caring for the sick is one of the uh, most important ways we can show our love for each other. Um, at the end of the talk, we'll touch on some principles to help decide uh, if a suggested treatment, if a doctor is suggesting a treatment, if that's appropriate for you as an Orthodox Christian. I do want to emphasize some boundaries to that, that I will not uh, be able to provide either during the talk or in the questions and answers specific medical advice or comment on specific cases. I think part of what I'm going to say in my talk is that these, a lot of the difficult decisions are very individual and require a lot of um, pastoral considerations of that, that making a decision is right for that particular person or that family. Thus, with some exceptions, we avoid making blanket judgments regarding good or evil. I mean, there are some medical procedures or what are touted to be medical procedures, which are just, uh, you know, completely against what we believe as Orthodox Christians. But there's a lot of other ones that are uh, controversial, and yet um, I certainly don't have the authority to either endorse or condemn them. Um, specifically, one of the topics that um, is, is very, has been very politicized and uh, is, uh, you know, very emotional is the uh, controversy regarding vaccination. And that's beyond the scope of this talk. That might be something we want to cover in a different talk or a different forum. Um, so as, as uh, Alexei mentioned, uh, my qualifications. And again, I was, was with a great blessing that I've been able to serve as a deacon for the last uh, 10 years uh, in our parish, which is in upstate New York, uh, now directly under um, uh, His Eminence um, uh, Archbishop and Metropolitan Demetrius. Um, and most importantly in my training is that I've been blessed by a wonderful family uh, who have uh, provided me with many firsthand experiences in, in both chronic and acute illness and have uh, both in my work as a medical oncologist and in um, helping my family members get through some of these crises have shown uh, the great mercy of God and uh, some of the utility of the things that we'll talk about. Um, glory to God, all my sons now are, are healthy, uh, happy, and none of them are in prison. So I uh, count my blessings uh, on, on that. Um, 
So to, to talk about some of the challenges, and, and I will end on some optimistic notes on how to confront those, how to, how to deal with those challenges. We have to recognize that most physicians in our society are not Christian, um, so that we, have, we can't assume that they understand uh, some of the things that might be extremely uh, obvious or, or just natural to us. Uh, the a physician might not, or nurses or other healthcare workers just might not have those, that background. Physicians are also trained not to discuss religion or moral issues with their patients. There's a, um, because of our very diverse secular society, um, physicians are expected to provide kind of a materialistic approach to medicine. Um, telling people, relying on uh, tests, uh, performing procedures, prescribing medications based on um, scientific research and guidelines, um, and not really considering as much, maybe as they ought to, uh, what impact those procedures have uh, on the patients that are undergoing them. Um, some things that are also important, and I don't want to overemphasize that, but they're, they're realistic. Um, there are some conflicts of interest. Uh, physicians, uh, you know, one very natural one is physicians are typically often very pressed for time. So um, the time for visits are very uh, short. Uh, many times, the time for the visit, the, the priorities of the physician may differ from that of the patient. Um, the physicians are often uh, graded on whether they've offered particular tests or treatments uh, to the patients, uh, whether or not they get reimbursed for that. That's something that, uh, at least in New York State, is very highly regulated by our legislature and, and the federal government also. Um, you know, encourages people to uh, get mammograms and vaccines and their blood pressure checked, whereas the patient really may be more interested in uh, or may feel it's more important to discuss some other problems. Um, there's certainly a potential conflict of interest of, of physicians doing things, prescribing or pre performing procedures or prescribing things in order to get reimbursed. Um, again, I think that's something that is important to think about, but I would encourage people not to be um, sort of generalizing and saying, well, I'm not going to go to the doctor because that's all they do is want to get money. Um, but certainly financial issues are very important. Um, the biggest uh, threat, I think, is the very... Uh, clear and accelerating a moral trend in our society where, um, you know, and, and I don't, can't really discuss the reasons behind this, but there's no doubt at all that um, the media and the government uh, um, and this, the, the entertainment uh, industry are really pushing um, a lot of things that Christians believe are immoral and just wrong. And physicians in this system are under great pressure, in fact, are mandated to provide access to uh, procedures such as contraception or, or medications, uh, provide abortion if uh, patients want it, and even things like uh, sex change treatments. Um, and, you know, that's just a reality. There are certainly individual physicians who, um, who do not agree with these things and do everything they can to uh, not provide them, but there, there's, that's clearly a trend. And we need to recognize that some of these uh, procedures and medications are made available even to minor children, often without the, the parent's knowledge. Um, so that could be a talk in itself. Again, um, the, the lack of respect, the, the actual 
systematic destruction of the idea that parents are responsible for their children, that, that uh, communities are responsible to help each other, help the members of their communities uphold ethical and moral standards. There's a very, and, and they're you know, based on these uh, notions of things like privacy or acceptance of diversity or things like that. But um, as, or, as Christians, we really see them as, as normalization of destructive behaviors. Uh, just yesterday uh, in our state, in New York, um, you know, uh, recreational marijuana was legalized. I know we're way behind California. So, um, you know, and, and some other states, there are certainly states in which uh, euthanasia or, uh, you know, the self or physician assisted suicide has been legalized. And, and certainly by, uh, again, you know, um, confirmation of cabinet members who with great fanfare say that they are openly transgender as if that's a qualification to give advice on you know their field of, of uh, specialization but somehow that is felt to be a very good thing so we our society is under great pressure to provide um, even you know medical, interventions that may be destructive and they're considered normal so that those of us who object to them have an uphill battle. Um, so what can we do about this? Well, it does put more responsibility on the patient. And at least my experience is that most physicians will respect clearly stated relig religious beliefs. And I know that uh, there are there are many um, religions or uh, groups, uh, for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses, who are very strict about um, receiving blood transfusions or not receiving blood transfusions, or even medications that have some blood potentially blood proteins in them. They're very strict about refusing them. I know that in our hospital. Uh, that is always respected and supported. We have a lot of Amish and Mennonite patients who have very uh, particular beliefs and, um, you know, that their beliefs are uh, respected. Uh, the responsibility becomes ours, the patients, to be clear about what we believe. And especially, as I just mentioned in the previous slides, we have the responsibility to educate our children, to be um, open with them and to be as clear as possible with them about what's acceptable and, and, then, and then what we should stay, you know, help steer them away from harm because um, we will not be the ones to make the decision, uh, especially as they get into their uh, teens or, you know, early adulthood. Um, what do we mean by being clear? Uh, well, uh, you know, and, and believing it. So what kinds of things um, do we want? Well, we want to evaluate the advice given uh, in light of our spiritual well-being. And again, I don't, I certainly don't mean we have to be hamstrung. I think if somebody has an infection and a physician prescribes an antibiotic, that's there's not a, a lot of uh, uh, analysis that needs to be given. Um, on the other hand, if somebody has a serious illness like cancer and a physician prescribes a chemotherapy, which can be really a life-changing experience, um, there certainly should be uh, some thought about, well, what does this mean? What does this illness mean? What do these treatments mean? What do they mean for my family? How do I how do we all work together to hope to cope with them? And certainly, if somebody says, "Well, you know, I want to have a procedure so that I can't get pregnant, or, or I want to take this pill so that I don't get pregnant," uh, obviously that has very important uh, implications, um, you know, for the sp spiritual well-being of the patient. How do we communicate with our doctor? Well. It's important to be practical and concrete. I think that 
um, doctors respond well um, because we are practicing a trade after all. It, uh, um, if, if we're asked a specific question about a, a treatment and, um, you know, for example, if there's a con um, contraceptive um, method and, if, and you say, well, is, is there a chance that uh, an actual, you know, baby will be formed and then because of this method, it will be uh, uh, miscarried, it will be aborted. And the doctor, I think, will, will be able to answer that question, yes or no. Um, if you say, uh, if, you, if a person comes in and, and starts sort of uh, making overgeneralized statements or um, trying to get the doctor involved in a moral uh, controversy or a moral condemnation of something, I think that's not going to be fruitful because um, with rare exception, again, that's the, the, the doctor would feel that that's really not part of their role and would not really know how to respond to that person. So I think it, it uh, as well as possible, and I think here's where, here's where our uh, clergy should be able to help is to help people frame their questions uh, in what, you know, what would really help them make a decision. Um, so if a person is struggling with the question of whether, say, whether to take an antidepressant or not, um, you know, if they ask their doctor, well, what are the side effects? Uh, patient, you know, they'll talk about things like dry mouth and diarrhea. Uh, if, but uh, uh, their priest, if they're struggling with depression or struggling with anxiety, and the priest could potentially help them um, ask the doctor about, well, you know, is this going to make me numb to emotion? Is this going to uh, make me addicted to a medication that I'll have to take for the rest of my life? Or, you know, is this going to change uh, something about my, my ability to fast or pray or things like that. And that may be, those may be more practical questions um, that, uh, that help focus the idea, uh, you know, the ideas and at least have the person aware, be aware of, you know, what they're getting into. Um, at the, at the same time, again, you know, uh, being empowered or not being afraid of asking the physician questions, it's very important. Again, with the, you know, the, on the, for serious interventions or treatments, to reach a clear understanding of what the goals are of whatever the physician is proposing. Um, many times the physician will propose something that's based on a guideline. And then, but if when you really ask, well, what is it going to do for me? Uh, either there's a very vague answer or potentially a very dangerous answer. Um, this comes up very frequently in um, prenatal care where currently, again, in our society, there's a whole list of tests that physicians are um, expected to recommend to pregnant women, and they are to identify birth defects uh, or, or potential birth defects. Um, well, if there's a possibility of impacting on the uh, growing child, the child in the womb, so that we can help heal or decrease the impact of that birth defect, that test might be helpful. And um, in one of our, you know, one of our children uh, was diagnosed with uh, spina bifida prior, you know, in utero. And this allowed us, first of all, a great deal of, of spiritual uh, preparation and, and some very important blessings, um, but also some very important medical preparation. We were able to uh, arrange for a neurosurgeon to be available, you know, immediately. In fact, we went to, a, um, a, you know, to see a specialist. We, my Melissa delivered at um, hospital, you know, out of town, 
you know, in order to have some of these interventions done that have helped, they think, you know, have medically helped our child. On the other hand, if the testing, then the result of the testing is, well, we can't help your child, but we, you know, we can do an abortion. Well, that's wrong. And uh, that's, um, uh, so you have to at least know what the possible recommendations will be based on the recommended test. Um, the whole idea of treatments, um, is the treatment solely to prolong your life or to, uh, to address a symptom that could be addressed other ways? Uh, there's one you know, very important considerations regarding heart uh, operations. Um, in the United States, uh, physicians, the, the medical system uh, does an enormous number of heart operations, um, some of them which now have become almost like science fiction. And in fact, you know, removing people's hearts and, and keeping them alive with an implanted pump, um, you know, that again, um, you know, really do have an impact on people's spiritual life and personality and, and their understandings of, of life and death. And before getting on that road, I think understanding those treatments, um, you know, are, are, is very important. Um, we'll come back to that a little bit at, towards the end of the talk, but I think this is very important asking questions. And if your physician is not able to give you answers to these questions, it's important to seek other opinions. And of course, in some places in the country, it's much easier than in others. Uh, but it's, it's at least, um, at least reaching out now by uh, one of the, um, you know, things that's really changed in the last year is the availability of video um, you know, video visits with doctors, uh, networking, you know, trying to understand uh, what, um, you know, what your, you know, your individual physician is proposing by talking to others. Um, on the other hand, you have a responsibility to be honest with your doctor. Um, if they're giving you recommendations and you simply say, yes, doctor, and then don't even try to follow them, it, this is not a good relationship. If you're seeking other opinions without being open with your doctor, that's also, um, and specifically, um, many people think, well, I'm, I'll just you know, go talk to a naturopath and a nutritionist and an acupuncturist and everything like that. And at the end, they come up with this whole uh, basket full of different kinds of treatments and maybe none of the practitioners really know what the patient is doing as a whole. And at some point, well, I mean, I think the, the patient has to understand how important it is to integrate this and to communicate. Switching to a more pastoral issue, it's extremely important that you communicate about your illness with your spiritual father, your parish priest, and your family. And um, I think this is something that the clergy in our church um, should encourage more. And honestly, family members should encourage more. Sometimes there still is this um, either embarrassment or concern or fear of acknowledging, well, this is a serious illness that I'm facing. And, you know, if I talk to the priest or ask for uh, a, an intercessory or uh, something like that, that somehow is a fearful thing that it's, um, I'm, I'm acknowledging how serious this illness is. Well, that's backwards. Uh, we should, we, in our morning and evening prayers, we pray for ourselves, we pray for our family, our loved ones, we pray for our enemies, we pray for the whole church. And part of that is for the health and salvation of all these people. And the prayers of the church, especially the commemoration of divine liturgy, is a very powerful intercession that um, has true 
true meaning and true uh, efficacy. And uh, remember that commemoration at Divine Liturgy, um, when a person is commemorated, a particle from the, the prosphora from, is taken out and placed into the chalice with the, with the body and blood of Christ. It's a form of communion with, uh, with Christ. And it's definitely something that anyone who is ill uh, should make a particular request that they be commemorated. Um, the fathers tell us, uh, the mothers tell us that, that praying for the sick is one of the major alm, the works of, of almsgiving that monastics can do. Um, and that's their, that's their job. That they, that's how they, um, how they uh, give alms and, and, and help uh, the church. Um, so take advantage of that. Take, you know, ask uh, for those prayers. Um, and I think that there, it's one of these things that sort of in, on a parish level, um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, it's maybe it's assumed that people do this. Maybe people take it for granted. Um, but uh, maybe people think that the priest has some kind of knowledge about them that the priest doesn't. Um, but I think it's very important to let the priest know and then let the priest know uh, when someone has been healed. I mean, when, when someone's recovered. Um, I, just as a deacon, I, uh, we have this uh, list of people we commemorate during the liturgy as ailing. And when I've ever come around to try to figure out if any one of them have recovered, I usually get more names to add to the ailing list, but nobody will admit that, that they're recovered. Um, but that's okay. We, we keep commemorating them and um, hopefully it helps. Um, but please be, you know, be also be thankful and, and actually a very appropriate thing to do is to ask the priest to serve a, uh, a Thanksgiving motive and a, a acknowledging just like the, the leper who turned, the, who was healed and turned and, and uh, thanked uh, the Lord our God for the healing. Um, and he received a great deal of, of grace and emphasis on his uh, belief for that act of um, acknowledgement and thanksgiving. We should also thank uh, God when we are healed. Um, what are some of the practical ways that we approach our life during an illness? Um, it's important to live your faith. You want to, of course, increase attention to your personal prayer. Um, you want to uh, wear a cross. It's something that we should really insist on uh, when we're in the hospital or even during medical procedures. One of the issues comes up is sometimes we're told to remove all jewelry and remove uh, metal from the body. And there's a reason for that. During operations, uh, electrical equipment is used and, and metal can be um, actually very dangerous. But, you know, there are wooden crosses available, uh, beautiful ones, um, and it can be, they can be on a string. They can be, um, you know, if, the, if they can't be... Um, on a string around the neck, they can be taped uh, with surgical tape to your chest or, um, you know, someplace um, appropriate. And that's an important um, statement of faith and an important, um, uh, the, cr the cross helps us to uh, overcome trials. Having holy icons in your room allows a, a, a person to focus. We grow up as Orthodox people, and we, when we pray, we often turn to an icon. And, and um, um, attending church services very important. If if you're ill and you can't be there for the whole time, but still make the effort to uh, to come to venerate the icons to receive the blessings uh, of the church. Um, and. Um, this leads to some of the things I've, you know, touched on already is that there are very um, beneficial pastoral opportunities um, when someone is ill 
uh, in our family or in our parish. Um, again, the, the ill person should humbly and, and modestly uh, inform and request prayers. And, it, and I, I think it's um, from a pastoral point of view, we should, um, we should emphasize to our parishioners that people do have the right of privacy you know, people should not be gossiping and saying, oh, you know, so-and-so has this and that affliction. Uh, we should just accept the fact that they've asked for our prayers and we pray for the sick. Uh, we should try to visit the sick or, or at least call them. And an important part of the pastoral opportunity when patients, when people are faced with a chronic illness uh, or a, a severe illness that requires an operation or an intensive care stay, the families and the caregivers of that person uh, often really do appreciate some help. And um, practices that are very good uh, do offer to visit. Again, respect the fact that people might be tired or not feel like entertaining visitors. Um, one very positive thing to do is to offer to pray with the person who's ill or with their family. And I think as, as, um, as Orthodox Christians, we're not uh, often skilled or feel skilled or comfortable in sort of uh, uh, spontaneous prayer, um, or may even have a difficulty if we're nervous or tired, um, you know, sort of praying from memory. So, um, I really found in, in my family that having a prayer book with us, uh, it was very, very helpful. And say, instead of watching the TV or just reading old magazines, reading our prayer books uh, while we're waiting for the doctor or while the family member's having an operation, or even if, um, um, you know, when I had a son who was in the hospital for a long time and wasn't feeling well, but we would come in and we would read the evening prayer rule, um, you know, out loud and he was dozing or sleeping, but it was a very, um, very positive experience for, I think for us and for, for them. And I think we should try to emphasize that. I think it's, um, at least in my experience, rare that people do that. A lay person pray with another lay person, but it's, it really should be something that is very um, universal. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe, maybe people do this, but um, I would encourage that to be one of the things that you offer to do when you're visiting an ill person. And, and you know, kind of get their sense of, are they comfortable with this? And, and should it just be saying our father and asking for God's blessing? Or should it be something like reading, reading in a caucus? Then um, I think you want to get their input, but this can be a very good experience. Um, one of the major ways that, lead, that people suffer when they're ill or disabled is the sense of isolation. So instead of being able to participate in family and parish life, people might be uh, homebound or bedbound or in a hospital. And um, it's very important to try to include the people in the um, ongoing events in the family and parish, um, maybe photographs of, of the feast, videos of uh, church services, um, uh, you know, events that, that have happened. Um, Again, I'm going to emphasize that we should try to be positive and not, um, not uh, gossip and especially avoid um, telling sick people about how someone else is even sicker uh, or things like that. And regrettably, that's a temptation that, that people have. If a person wants to talk, listen to them that again, um, uh, sick people in the hospital or in a institution are very much surrounded by people who aren't really listening to them. The nurse comes in, takes their blood pressure, leaves. Doctor comes in, tells them what the next set of tests they're going to have, and then leaves. So sometimes uh, one of the biggest relief 
uh, ways that we can minister to a person is just to listen to what they have to say. And that's, that can be very, very uh, therapeutic. Some pitfalls, um, again, should go without saying, but avoid blaming God for suffering or, you know, trite statements like, well, we don't know why God allowed this, but, you know, there must be a reason or things like that. But, you know, don't, that's, that's really rarely uh, beneficial. And definitely avoid judgmental statements. Um, regrettably, um, people are tempted to remark on the patient's appearance or criticize their circumstances or their medical care. And again, unless you're really going to advocate about something, if you see that something's wrong and you're planning to help the person uh, get better care, uh, simply raising questions about their medical care is, is not helpful. Um, avoid blaming the sick person for the ailment, whether, um, you know, uh, it's maybe it is because they smoke or they ate too much or, or something, but reminding them of that while they're ill is not very helpful. And avoid giving medical advice, which includes nutritional advice and alternative med medicine advice. One of the things that one of our, my patients uh, find very, very stressful is that they constantly get well-meaning advice from family and friends saying, oh, you know, there's this new herb or this vegetable or this doctor in California who can help you. And, and people really, um, again, unless you're really going to buy them the plane ticket to go to California or vice versa, um, it's often not very helpful. Uh, and it may just raise the person's stress. Uh, one of the pitfalls is avoiding comparisons to themselves. You're there to help that person listen to their concerns. Don't tell them about your ailments uh, or you know, other people that you know. So those are just some practical pitfalls. And I think that um, this is part of our, it could be part of our ministry. Um, I would encourage people to consider reaching out to caregivers, especially if someone in the family is uh, chronically ill or hospitalized. Um, it's very, very stressful. And sometimes it's something like letting the dog out or, or checking on, you know, checking on a family member, or, you know, if you're in a position to do so, um, having the kids come to your house after school or something like that can really free up um, the caregiver to get some rest or to be at the hospital with the sick person or thing like that. And again, offering um, help with food or shopping and, and many times just, just kindness, just acknowledging the fact that you know that that person's going through um, a struggle uh, can be very, very helpful. Um, I know that there are, there are parishes um, where there are actually, uh, it's a, you know, sort of an organized parish ministry um, of visiting people in nursing homes, visiting people in the hospital, uh, helping each other. And I think this is something that's, uh, that, um, and again, I'm not saying that that's our parish by any means, uh, um, but it's a, it's a, I think it's a laudable goal and it's the kind of thing that can be, that really doesn't involve an investment. It's not like trying to, um, you know, have a soup kitchen or, um, you know, commit to delivering meals or something like that, but it can, it can be on a very um, informal way. But on the other hand, it is something that, um, again, both lay people uh, and there's many, many resources that uh, we can, if, if people are interested in that, um, lay people, uh, certainly many parishes have nurses and doctors and um, other kinds of health care givers who, who are familiar with things like that and can help give advice and um, uh, run a program. So um, those are some very positive things that we can do to help 
those who are ill and, and, and those around us. Um, for the last few minutes of my talk, and I am, I know I'm running uh, right against the time here, but um, just a few words about helping figure out, you know, what kinds of procedures, you know, how, what are benchmarks or touchstones? How do we know what's good for you, for your spiritual life and what might be dangerous? Um, again, emphasizing that this is something that you should consider for yourself or for your family or for, you know, or if, you know, in the, in the sense of clergy, which I'm sure everyone does, is realize this is, this is a pastoral thing and refrain from judging others who, whose circumstances you might not understand. Um, and there are, you know, one is that we know that there are many, many examples of healing miracles, actually both, you know, there some in the Old Testament and certainly uh, in Christ's um, uh, ministry on earth and the apostles and the saints thereafter, innumerable healing miracles. They're really uh, the sine qua non of, of Christianity. They're not ever miracles for show or for um, you know, some kind of material uh, improvement, but typically healing and typically, and many times Christ especially is very, very clear that it's, it's a, um, a type, uh, it's, it symbolizes forgiveness of sins and it should lead to salvation. It's based on faith, either of the person who asks for the healing or people interceding for them, or Christ asking people, do you have faith? Do you think I can heal you? And if a person acknowledges that they have faith, Christ then um, uh, does heal them. Typically uh, or frequently uh, states your sins are forgiven, um, states go and sin no more. Um, and many times it's, again, fun restoring their function. So the paralytic, the, um, the greatest example is, you know, the uh, St. Peter's um, mother-in-law who was healed of a fever and got up and served them. Uh, you know, th those kinds of examples where the resurrection of the widow's only son, um, Clearly in that time, uh, there was no social security or welfare. If a widow had no family, um, she would be a pauper. She would have to beg. Um, so it was very clear to the crowd that this poor woman was condemned to a life of, uh, you know, just uh, poverty and misery uh, because her son had died. And Christ resurrected him not to you know, make a show of things, but to take care of, of his mother. Um, so those types of healing are very, very important. And um, how do we analyze whether something is sort of in, in God's will? And very quickly, um, some of the Holy Fathers talk about the steps that, that go from obedience to trust or faith and then to love for God. And we always have to consider that even if we don't understand something, obedience is very, very important and prudence is very, very important. If you think that uh, something will, uh, you know, immediately happen, everything will turn around, uh, you'll be, a miracle will appear and you'll be healed. Well, you don't want to jump into that because it's, it's not prudent. Um, we talked about this before, that we should evaluate medical advice in light of our spiritual well-being. And I think, again, uh, considering any type of action, is it going to bring us closer to God, to our fellow man, to our, um, to our church, or further away? And regrettably, a lot of the things that we're doing now bring us take us further away from God or even our acts of rebellion against God's will and um, 
uh, divide people instead of uniting them. We agree that uh, Christians should be responsible stewards of, of their body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the fasting rules of the church are very healthy for a person. Um, avoiding smoking and excessive alcohol and recreational drugs are very healthy for a person. Um, something that's important to note is, is moderation in sports and fitness routines. Uh, one of the things in our society has become almost a, um, a, a cult uh, of uh, fitness and of all these amazing um, things that people do. And then, and then what are called extreme sports or or just taking regular sports to ultimate things, you know, instead of running a mile uh, and getting some exercise, people run marathons and then they run ultra marathons and they, you know, do all these things that are uh, honestly taking them away from their families, from their, from any type of spiritual life. And although it's not intrinsically sinful to run, but if you're training uh, in, in all your free time and uh, organizing your life around your sports and fitness routines, you're probably not paying as much attention to your spiritual life as you should be. Um, consider, is it possible to avoid a treatment? Is it possible to be, to be patient, to patiently bear the ailment? And sometimes the treatment does prolong an illness one very uh, example that was very uh, striking to me was this elderly woman in our parish who um, had heart trouble. She had a bad heart valve, but she, um, she had lived with it for many, many years, but kept going to her doctor and saying that she's short of breath and her feet swell. And, and finally, her doctors convinced her that she should have an operation. And um, she had an operation and spent you know, regrettably, the, less of, the rest of her uh, brief life after an operation in misery in an intensive care unit because things did not go well. And, um, you know, honestly, at her point in life, it would have been better to bear the ailment without trying to um, fix it and, and to pray for a peaceful death. So my biggest practical uh, advice is, does the proposed treatment mean to restore your function? And do you have a, a duty to your, uh, to your family, to your parish, to the church, to uh, society, to, that you will do something with that function? Whereas warning signals that the, the intervention is not a God-pleasing things is any type of mutilation of our appearance, um, tattoos and regrettably the just the uh, uh, the um, I mean the only word for it is demonic uh, mutilations that people now are doing to their uh, implanting things and, and rearranging their 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 whole appearance but regrettably enhancement of our appearance uh, such as plastic surgery just for um, uh, cosmetic reasons. Um, things that, that people do through exercise and, and maybe, maybe outrageous diets that are done to try to enhance our appearance can always, it also, it's to, it's to serve ourselves, not to serve our families or, or, or become closer to God. And other warning signs is, does the intervention have a spiritual aspect directly to it? And examples include a lot of the things that are um, promoted as sort of feel good, uh, you know, relaxation techniques or uh, parts of exercise uh, um, uh, routines. But regrettably, a lot of alternative physicians or, or alternative practitioners also use um, methods of healing that rely on um, spiritual forces in the body or, or call upon spiritual forces from outside the body to, to have those interventions. Um, there's lots of examples of things and I'm sure a lot of questions and I've talked for a little longer than I had hoped for. So I will conclude with, with just, you know, um, the 
fear of the Lord. So obedience to the Lord is the foundation of wisdom and that results in good judgment. But someone who just trusts in man um, and trusts in himself uh, departs from the Lord. So always consider, you know, what, what are we striving for? Um, and some of what illness is an incredibly visceral reminder of our mortality and our relationship with God. And if it wasn't for an illness, we might, a lot of people might not really consider God. And I know that my own experiences have definitely uh, helped focus a lot of my faith. So I, I pray that some of these words were um, beneficial and um, I welcome questions. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Father, Father Peter, for, for uh, sharing with us your thoughts and your insights. We do have a, a question that came in, Father Peter. Um, if someone has a treatable cancer, but is terrified of chemotherapy and its side effects, is it a sin to decline the highly recommended treatment? So that's a, a wonderful example of, uh, again, where the, where the decision is very individual and certainly would have spiritual um, implications to it. And I would uh, answer, I would, I would explore, so as a physician, uh, it's my responsibility to explore uh, what kinds of fears they have. Um, are those fears uh, potentially ameliorable? That is, a lot of people, uh, you know, remember the worst thing that happened to somebody they knew or something they read. Um, and uh, there may be a strategy to help a person um, address those fears, to decrease the fears. Um, I think if we would explore the uh, potential benefits of the proposed treatments versus uh, the potential risks. And um, honestly, I would, in, you know, for instance, if it's a, uh, a young person with many, potentially many years of life uh, in front of them, uh, many years of service to their family or church, I would, you know, maybe be more forceful um, recommending a treatment. Uh, whereas if it's someone who has the, in a way, freedom to say, I'm, I'm going to focus on repentance, on uh, preparing for death, and I want to have the clear mind and the energy to do that, uh, that indeed may be the beneficial thing for them. Um, just as an example, regrettably, I've, I've known people who um, are offered a course of treatment and perhaps the first treatment actually puts them into remission and they feel better and they can, can function again, but maybe they have a relapse. And, and then if there's really not a realistic uh, feeling that the disease can be cured, uh, the treatments can become burdensome and can uh, exhaust a person's physical and mental energies. Um, and, you know, at some point, uh, uh, an honest physician should be able to say to the person, I think the treatments are hurting you more than helping you. Um, the patient should be, uh, should be willing to discuss that with their physician. The patient could bring it up and say, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm getting better. I think I'm just, you know, sick all the time um, or, or, or something like that. So um, I don't think it's something that people can sort of decide ahead of time. Um, and I think people should have an open mind. And it's certainly something that they should talk to their spiritual fathers. I don't think a priest uh, would, again, we're not expecting for uh, lay people that the priest would say, oh yes, you must have this treatment or not, you know, it's God's will or something like that. Um, I think the role of the priest in this kind of situation is to, again, um, 
feel out what are the person's anxieties and fears and, and from a spiritual nature, what kinds of things do they need to confess or prepare? Um, and you know, maybe what kinds of things they should ask the doctor. I don't think we should be putting our priests in the position of making decisions whether a person should have a treatment or not, but they should certainly help the person uh, focus their thoughts. We did have another question come in. Um, would you recommend Orthodox Christians that are looking for a career uh, to consider the, the healthcare field? Um, it seems like there is so much controversy in medicine right now. Can one be spiritually healthy and still provide care to others? So I, I'll answer that in a positive way. I still think that that um, uh, medical providing medical care um, is an incredible uh, blessing and an incredible um, opportunity to um, to you know to help people face things. And uh, again, we don't we don't always. Um, you know, life isn't easy, and uh, the you know, the the apostles and the preachers and the ministers they they dealt with uh, all kinds of you know pagans and and were persecuted and um, you know so it's not that we should try to pick a career where we're surrounded by people that agree with us. Um, uh, in fact, it's very, very rewarding to just by, um, well, uh, you know, I mean, what, what makes it hard? Sometimes it's hard to deal with difficult people. And by saying this is my, not just my job, but it's, it's, it's the way I can um, try, to, try to sort of fulfill some of these things about, you know, showing kindness to people that aren't kind to me. Or, or being at least polite to people who are not polite to me. It's a very, very, um, you know, it's a very good field in which you can have the opportunity to, uh, to do this. It's a very good field where you have the opportunity to really daily see people struggling with, with mortality, people uh, the, with miracles, you know, real, uh, countless, countless times, and I don't mean that, you know, people's limbs regrow or their, uh, you know, or, or their, you know, but many times it, they are miracles, people being reconciled with their families, uh, people realizing things about things in their life, uh, and sometimes people who you would never think survive um, you know, are surviving, they're taking care of their grandchildren or something like that, and you can really see that. So it's a very rewarding field. I think that um, there are certain aspects of the field that regard, regrettably are so uh, difficult to practice that is, um, you know, you, you certainly want to throw yourself into, um, you know, regrettably, you know, OBGYN where People are being asked to perform abortions and things like that. So um, I think you have to have some discretion, but I would, um, I would certainly encourage, and, and I would say that overall, again, we, we talked about some of the challenges, but the, you know, I don't know, a vast majority of the time, um, the medical profession helps people. Um, and you know, um, so, yes, I think, I think it should certainly be considered. Do you, as a health practitioner, have an ethical responsibility to refer patients asking you moral or religious advice when considering medical intervention to seek alternative, alternative advice in that domain? So is there a benefit to specifically seeking out a Christian or an Orthodox Christian physician? I guess if, if the person is asking if given the choice, uh, should you go to a, a Christian physician or, or you know an Orthodox physician as opposed to a non-Christian physician, I, um, I would say that 
all things being equal, I mean, yeah, I think that that sounds like a good uh, choice. Um, I think in my personal practice, again, I am very careful not to proselytize directly, but um, there, and this is a, this is a, a topic that very inter interests me a very great deal uh, in terms of the words we use. And for instance, instead of saying, you know, oh, you're so lucky, or oh, I have, you know, good news, you say, well, we have a, there's a blessing. We have the blessing that you are out of pain or that your tumor has shrunk. And, and it's amazing how people react to that. A lot of people, uh, Protestants, Catholics, but even I've never had anyone object to it as far as I know. Um, you know, so um, saying, using the word expression, you know, God, if God wills, or uh, using the word hope instead of, um, um, you know, plan or uh, prom making it sort of a promise, you know. Um, now, are there, are there pious, uh, other pious physicians and ethical physicians and well-meaning physicians of all faiths? Yes, I believe that they are. Um, um, I think you just have to be discerning. So, um, you know, I don't, I, I, well, I think we should leave it at that. I think you should be discerning and, and um, you know, make sure that you're communicating with your physician, not necessarily that they're the same religion. I, we have a question about um, sort of end of life. Are there any recommendations um, that an Orthodox Christian should keep in mind, you know, with uh, DNR, do not resuscitate orders or anything else that uh, we should be doing as responsible Orthodox Christians in terms of in preparing for, for those types of situations, whether, you know, we know we've just been told that we have a potentially terminal illness or just, uh, you know, nowadays there's, uh, some, you know, car accidents and all kinds of things that could happen at any point in time. Should we be doing something uh, preemptively. Thank you for uh, whoever asked that question for bringing that up that it just didn't fit into the talk. First of all, again, I'd like to emphasize that if you're faced with a serious illness, really reach out to your spiritual father, uh, your priest. If you're in a community where there isn't a priest, um, uh, reach out somehow so that somebody knows, uh, I think at least it, say one of our monastic communities, or if there's a priest that could visit, just reach out to them, give them a heads up. They don't know that you're seriously ill unless you tell them. And um, uh, this, is, this is very, very important. Um, I think that advanced, there's so in a, in a nutshell, advanced directives are uh, there, there's two things, healthcare proxy, which means that if you're not able to sit up and talk with your doctors or whoever, who do you trust to do that? Um, typically it's the spouse uh, or the next of kin. So this could come up if there's a, a family in which, a, you know, you're Orthodox, but your family members might not be Orthodox. If there's any potential of um, uh, disagreement uh, it's very important to, to put that down in writing. Well, you know, if, I, if I'm in a situation where I'm in a coma or I can't, you know, make decisions, this is who I trust to be, uh, to be my decision maker. And that might be very important for someone who's in a family where their, uh, their spouse or their children are not Orthodox or pious. Uh, you might want to do that. Um, advanced directives are making decisions about um, uh, mechanical ways of supporting uh, life. And um, that um, certainly, uh, if anybody's interested in that, and um, I have some things I can suggest, we can, um, I can send it to them if they want to correspond. Or, um, but I think the most important thing when you're critically ill, if there's a potential way of restoring a person to um, uh, to consciousness so that they can um, uh, 
give a confession and, and partake of Holy Communion, um, that's worthwhile. Um, again, that's, that's kind of a judgment and you can't always tell that. But I mean, if, I, you know, if somebody's in a car accident, um, it makes sense to rush them to the hospital and try to patch them up enough so that, again, they can confess and commune. You know, if somebody, where, where this becomes very important is somebody has a chronic illness that they know is going to take their life sooner or later, um, it's probably not a good idea to end up in intensive care uh, with a machine, you know, breathing for you and, and spending, you know, spending your life hooked up to various tubes, especially if you can't speak and you can't take communion. Uh, and, you know, it sort of prolongs the, prolongs the dying process without obvious benefit. Now, that, again, that's a pastoral decision. Um, you know, it's something that individuals, but it's, there's certainly, a, I think, appropriate limits to what you want doctors to do to you if you're dying. Uh, and um, the... Uh, it is our responsibility, which many people, again, would rather not think about. It's our responsibility to confess regularly and commune regularly and um, uh, do a daily confession of your sins and, and you know, sort of be prepared as our, um, as our, you know, as our prayer rule often says, you know, you you pray that the, the bed will not be your deathbed. And when you get up in the morning, you, you thank God for uh, letting you have another day to, to repent. And um, you know, that's what we should be doing. Uh, uh, first among sinners, uh, you know, I get up and I rush around and I look for my car keys and I get to work and I answer all my emails. And you know, um, uh, am I really preparing for you know, spiritually, no, <laughs> you know, but we should be. So this is why uh, sometimes God allows illness so that it, it or allows people in their, you know, you know, to, to, as a wake up and say, Hey, you know, this is real. This is real. You have to, you have to be prepared. And the more you prepare, the more you'll be prepared when it actually happens. That's the other thing is somebody who, goes through life not thinking about things like this, uh, it's a big shock. And it's very difficult to suddenly, uh, I mean, it's a, it, again, it's a miracle, a miracle and it's a blessing if that, if it is God's gift, but it is certainly um, the teaching of the church and the fathers that we should all contemplate our mor mortality and prepare for it. Well, uh, I, I uh, reached out and had a last call for questions, but it seems like you've answered everyone's questions. Glory to God. So thank you so much, all of you, for, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Father Peter, uh, for taking the time to prepare this presentation and um, uh, sharing, sharing these thoughts uh, with all of us. Um, God willing, we will have more uh, public lectures coming up uh, this this um, this semester, and uh, you know, so keep an eye out for for more emails and announcements. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of a lot of people saying thank you, and um, so uh, I think uh, right now um, we'll we'll have a closing prayer. Thank you, Alexei. Thank you, Father Peter, very much. That was very beneficial, I'm sure, for everyone. Uh, good night to everybody, and thank you for your good your goodwill in joining us. And we look forward to having you together with us in, in more programs and presentations in the future. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us and save us. Good night. Bye-bye.